All right, Maggie, thanks for the introduction. Uh, and thanks to Ryan for the tech work behind the scenes. And thanks, Paul, for taking the time out of your night. And then thanks to everybody for being here. And then a big thanks to PFI for hosting this event. And as Maggie was saying, um, it's a group that has active membership. They do a lot of field days. They do a lot of farmer-led research. And it's something that if, if you like this webinar or if you're uh, interested in you know, a lot of different farm topics, I would consider being a member. So what we're going to talk about today and hopefully what all of you signed up for uh, is we're going to talk about prairie strips and farm conservation programs. My name is Tim Youngquist, and I work at the agronomy department at Iowa State University, which is located in Ames, Iowa, which is kind of smack dab in the middle of middle of Iowa, which is the middle of the United States. We grow a lot of corn and soybeans in Iowa. Uh, it's a big science and technology research institution. And this is where the idea for strips came from. I am here representing the, the group as what's called the farmer liaison. So I do a lot of the outreach and I help with the design and implementation of a lot of the strips and help facilitate research and things like that. But it's a large group of interdisciplinary researchers from sociology all the way to engineering. There's a lot of different folks looking at a lot of different aspects of this. And again, started at Iowa State, but involves partners all throughout the Midwest and um, you know, federal government, state government, private individuals, a lot of different things. So um, just keeping in mind, there's, there's a really big team that's looking at a lot of various aspects of this. I guess also I will say STRIPS. So it's a fancy acronym, but what it actually stands for is Science-Based Trials of Row Crops Integrated with Prairie Strips. Um, it's, it's a real mouthful, it's kind of an academic thing, but essentially what we're talking about is taking native prairie vegetation and integrating that into row crop fields. And I'll talk a little bit about what we found over the last 10 or 15 years of research and active impl implementation on farms. So why prairie? That's the big question. Back in 2004, when some researchers at Iowa State got the idea for this project, um, one of the things that they were wondering is if you could take small amounts of prairie and then insert them into a row crop field. I'll take a step back and provide a little bit of context with that. Right now, the state of Iowa is somewhere around 80 or 75 or 80% of a massive amount of the state is covered with two crops, that'd be corn and soybeans. So several, uh, you know, 23, 24 million acres of, of corn and soybeans. This is an annual system. These crops are, seeds are put into the ground every year. Uh, the crops are harvested and for, you know, seven months of the year, this incredibly valuable topsoil we have is really vulnerable here. If you'd go back in time about 150 or 200 years, the dominant ground cover in Iowa was tall grass prairie. So it was again about 80 or 85, you know, 83 or 85 percent of the state was covered with a mix of cool season grasses, warm season grasses, legumes, forbs, just an incredible diversity of wildlife bees, pollinators, all, all these different things. And in a very short amount of time, really just a span of a couple generations, that whole system was flipped from a perennial deep rooted, very diverse system into a system of annual crops. And then over a, a period of, of decades and really in more recent history than you could, you could imagine, um, We've intensified that agriculture and we've really whittled it down to just, just a few different crops, mainly just the corn and soybeans that are dominating the ground cover here. So that's kind of some history of why uh, we decided to start looking at prairie. Again, as I mentioned, it's perennial, so different than the annual crop that we have. You're going to have those living roots, deep rooted species that are in the ground all year round. These prairie plants are adapted to be here. They're accustomed to the very warm, uh, sometimes dry summers. They're adapted to extremely cold winters. Uh, the, the plants are very sturdy and they're very hardy, so they can act to really filter water much better than a lot of the introduced grasses, um, you know, some of the, the brome and, and fescues and things like that, that that typically we've been using in waterways or fence lines, things like that. Um, diversity, you know, I can't stress that enough. So you've got just this whole matrix of different plants that are filling different niches for 
various types of wildlife that again adapted along with those species over time that there's going to be you know certain moths or butterflies that are going to need certain species of grasses or forbs to lay their eggs on and and propagate um, and again it's native so kind of tying into the one of the beauties of the prairie strips is just it's it's so simple you know we're not trying to really create anything new we're just using something that was already here about 150 or 200 years ago and trying to insert a little bit of that back into the existing system um yeah and i i want everyone here to have a nice time and and get their questions answered so if if while we're going along if you have a question or if there's something that you think well i'd, I'd like to know more about that or whatever it's like let's hopefully find time to you know i'll try to be as comprehensive as i can as we're going through this but if there is a question that you have i would like to be able to answer those as well so going back to, you know, I said 2004 was when the idea was hatched for this. Um, and it took about three years. So then in 2007, the first strips were planted. And they were planted at the Neil Smith National Wildlife Refuge, which is a U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service property. And why, why did it end up at this place? Well, at that time in 2007, you know, getting to be 15 years ago now, the idea to put prairie into a row crop setting was too unconventional and Iowa State would not allow us to put this on university owned property. So we kind of um, looked around and what, what are our other options here? The Neil Smith National Wildlife Refuge, for those of you that are not familiar, it's the largest prairie reconstruction in the country. I think it's on the order of about 6,000 acres of continuous grassland that they have in this area, native prairie that they've restored. So it's not a remnant being that it was plowed up at one time, but um, they also happen to have some ag land there. So we found these small uh, experimental watersheds and we put prairie in a variety of different settings. These are all in corn and soybean fields. These were managed as a no-till system. All the herbicide was the same. The management was the same. The corn and soybean rotation was the same. Everything you know planted about the same day. You know All that was fairly consistent. We had a few different treatment and control sites. You can kind of see a picture here of what it would look like. You've got some small prairie and kind of that diamond shape at the middle. And then there's a couple of contour strips leading up the hill. We looked at 100% corn and soybeans in one, which would be kind of a, a control field. And then we tried putting 10% of that watershed into prairie all at the bottom. So you can kind of see that diamond shape. Imagine the contour strips not being there. That was one. Then we tried another where 10% split between the bottom and then two contour strips. So basically a third at the bottom, a third in the middle strip and a third at the top strip. And then we tried 20%. So again, at the bottom and in the middle. And we were kind of trying to find what was the right point where you could get the most kind of disproportionate benefits or the most bang for your buck um, from putting prairie out there into the field. And this that we're looking at here in the middle, um, this little white dot that you can see, I don't know if folks can see my cursor, but um, essentially you can see kind of the, the piece of equipment that's down there. And then this blown up picture, it's what's called a hydro hydrologic flume. So the engineering, ag engineering department at Iowa State cited these H flumes, hydrologic flumes at kind of the low point in these watersheds. So all the contributing area would drain to this common point which would allow us to measure the total amount of water that's moving through there, you know, whatever nutrients were with that water, whatever sediment was coming through there. And then there was a variety of other groundwater wells that were dug and just extensive implement or instrumentation were put into these watersheds. So we could start to peel away what would happen if you would put these prairie strips out into a field. Uh, these are, if, if you're at all familiar with the practice, you've maybe seen this photo series, but I, I don't think that that, even if you've seen it before, makes it any less shocking. So for thousands of years, prairie grew here in central Iowa. These deep roots, this diversity of the system, the regeneration, regrowth of the plants, the periodic fires from Native Americans and lightning strikes, all of this contributed to some of the absolute best soil on the planet. And I'm born and raised in Iowa. I grew up on a farm. I'm certainly very biased, but that is absolutely true. You know, some of you will, you will not find better soil in but about three other places on the planet. And Iowa is right there with them. In one four inch rain event, this is what occurred to lead to the picture on the left. So this was about June 3rd or June 4th, 
um, one rain event. And that H flume is about three and a half feet wide. So there's several inches of soil in this thing, this rich, black, incredible topsoil. Um, again, it's a no-till field, which no-till means there's no disturbance to the soil. You still have that much coming off in one rainstorm. Uh, the other control that we looked at was 100% prairie. You can see there crystal clear water coming out of the bottom. And then 10% of the field being put into prairie, you can see you're not eliminating the erosion, but drastically less by just putting 10% of the field into that permanent cover to again, filter the water and kind of slow the movement of the water as it's leaving the field. Uh, kind of some highlights from the first 10 years of the research. This was all with the 10% number. By putting 10% of the field into prairie, um, we've kind of found the most disproportionate benefit. By putting 20% of the field into prairie, you could achieve higher benefits, but you really hit like a point of diminishing return very soon after the 10%. You saw a, a better numbers with 20%, but again, that's doubling the amount of prairie. So it just, um, it just didn't really add up. So 10% was kind of that sweet spot. So a lot less, um, you know, again, taking 10%, I understand that that is a large number when we're talking about row crop production and you're asking someone to convert that land into prairie, which may be land that's profitable or being used to generate income for the farm. So I absolutely understand that that's not nothing, but these are staggering numbers to see a 37% reduction in the amount of overall water leaving that property. So through infiltration and through absorption and that uh, living plant material and evaporation and all those things, you know, you saw 37% less water leaving that field, 95% reduction in the overall amount of soil leaving that field. So that rich black topsoil is staying in place. And even if it's moving, say, to the edge of the field, it's not leaving the field. Um, and then two of the key fertilizers that are very helpful on the farm, but can become a problem when they move off site and into waterway or into surface water. So a 77% reduction in the amount of phosphorus leaving the field and a 70% reduction in the amount of nitrogen leaving the field. And then we also saw about a 70% re reduction in the amount of subsurface nitrate that was moving under the ground. Um, then also triple abundant, triple the number of pollinators and double the bird abundance. So seeing um, just providing these creatures that are trying to use the cornfield to lay their eggs, um, forage for nectar, things like that, just giving them an option, giving them a pretty good option versus either using the ditch or just the cornfield. Um, so, you know, you saw right away a good return to those wildlife numbers. We didn't see a negative effect on yield. So you're losing the opportunity of farming those areas by converting them. I'm not saying that there was no yield loss. The 10% that you're taking out of production is obviously off the table, but there wasn't an expanded yield loss from some competition between the prairie, things like that. Um, no additional weed problems. The weeds that were in the field prior to the prairie strip were the same weeds that were in the field after the prairie strip. So dandelions, pigweeds, water hemp, all that stuff. A lot of the prairie species are very small seeded. And if there's tillage or herbicide, an herbicide regime or some combination of both, it's gonna be very difficult for these small seeded species to migrate out away from the strip. Uh, and then in looking at other conservation practices, significantly cheaper than installing a terrace, which is basically a dirt berm that would be along the contour in the field and a, comparable to the annual cost of cover crops. Hey, so. Yes, Maggie, go ahead. Could you clarify, you know, what sets prairie strips apart from something like a contour buffer or just like a grass strip? Yeah, that's a really good question. And it's, um, I, I do a lot of these talks and often afterwards, I'm, I'm, I'm really hoping for questions like that because it's good to have these clarifying questions uh, to keep, keep me on track and let people, let me know what people are interested in. The big difference, so there have been buffer strips for thousands of years. I mean, since the advent of agriculture, um, you know, there's been, there's been buffers and there's been contour strips. This is certainly not a new concept. The biggest change would be, again, that native species component and the floral diversity and just the overall species diversity. That's going to be the big thing. 
because you can have a terrace or you can have a waterway or you can have, you know, a hayable alfalfa strip in the field, but you're not going to have the same deep roots. You're not going to have the same diversity of species that you're going to get with the prairie strip. So the concept is very similar, but again, it's just kind of the, the beautiful, elegant simplicity of it, you know, using these native species that were already here, putting them back out and then letting them filter water, um, keep soil in place and provide habitat for some of the native wildlife. So what Paul is really gonna talk about later is this, what we call strips two. So strips one was kind of when we were at the Neil Smith Wildlife Refuge and then strips two was when we kind of transitioned out into the world. And that was 2014 when I was hired on with the team to kind of be this farmer liaison role. Um, I grew up on a farm and I still help my dad farm to this day up in Northwest Iowa. Um, Paul, who's in actual Northwest Iowa would probably consider Sac County West Central Iowa, um, but grew up on a farm. And then I had a lot of knowledge about prairie from uh, different ecological restoration jobs that I'd had uh, after college. So it was kind of, it was just like a perfect fit for me. And I really uh, took it off and running and was able to go all around the state and work with wonderful farmers and landowners to help them achieve prairie strips on their land. And I'll talk a little bit about the design. And if you're interested in getting these on your land, um, there's, there's a few just basic principles to follow. So if you're interested in achieving some of the benefits that I was talking about, you know, if you're interested in the water and the sediment flow, which is kind of what these, this practice is really designed for, I would say the design is going to depend on where the water is flowing through the property. Um, if you look at this picture here in front of us, imagine the green buffer zone takes up 10% of that field. But unless you're living in, you know, parts of Nebraska or parts of, you know, parts of the country where it's very, very flat, the water is not going to flow this way. So these arrows that we assume when we make a linear buffer, well, we're buffering 10% of the area. Eh, that's not necessarily how the water is going to go. So imagine these squiggly lines are contours. The arrows represent concentrated flow. So you can imagine how water flows over a hillside. You have gullies, you have waterways, you have just areas where the water is naturally going to flow. Um, and then what ends up happening, oops, uh, I don't know why that thing kind of bumped around, but here where the water is flowing through, you're actually only buffering about 4% of that watershed. And you have sort of misplaced buffer in the rest where water is not really flowing through. So if you want to filter the water and you want to keep that soil from leaving your property, it can be really as simple as just on the edge of the field, wherever um, you can think of it, if you're giving water away to someone or if you're receiving water onto your property, those are absolutely the areas to start. And that's always where I start when I'm in, I mean, not even necessarily in a hilly field, but even in a flat field, look at those fence line areas. And if you can create a half moon or a diamond or whatever's gonna work with your equipment, putting a buffer in there, is gonna be um, just a, a great way to kind of put a little picture frame around that field and keep those nutrients in that soil on your property. And then if the contour works, um, you could buffer up into the field. Again, this is gonna kind of depend, you know, it's, it's nice to stay to the contour if you can, but um, you know, here, so further up in Northwest Iowa, this would be Dickinson County, um, boy, it's, it can be really difficult. You know, I, I grew up uh, in kind of some gently rolling hills on our farm and my dad is a masterful contour farmer. So it's like, I've just gotten used to that, you know, my whole life. It wasn't until, you know, I moved down here to Ames and it's just like, a lot of the world's not like that. You know, a lot of people don't, uh, don't necessarily plant on the contours, but there are some fields where it's just impossible. As much as it would be nice to farm to the contours, you would, I mean, this is a, a spaghetti pile in this field. But the, the cool part of the prairie strips is it gives the farmer the flexibility to kind of point to where they want that conservation on their farm. And what we have going here is a lot like that diagram that I just showed you, where you have areas that are wider along the edge of the field that are grabbing a larger contributing area. So even though it's relatively flat and it's not really on the contour, you see, um, again, this is hard to, hard to necessarily explain on the computer, but imagine these large kind of um, triangle little polygons on the, the left side of the screen. 
those are just draining a larger area. So by making those chunks bigger, you slow that water down, you keep that soil from you know, basically charging off the field. Imagine it's running off the field. You want to make some speed bumps and make that water start walking off the field instead. And rather than just having, say, a 120 foot wide buffer along the whole length of the field edge where you're taking an incredible amount of acreage out of production, be strategic and target those areas where water is leaving the field or entering the field. Um, and you can really maximize the, the sediment and nutrient control aspect of the prairie strips. Uh, here's kind of a, a little bit of a fun one. This is a lot what my job is like. So the red lines that are on this document came from a, an NRCS or Natural Resource Conservation Office, which is an arm of the U.S. Department of Agriculture that helps farmers and landowners enroll in conservation programs. These represent contour strips. And while not as wild or as squiggly as the last farm that I was showing you, um, that was one perspective. And then another point of view is represented by what you can see these pen marks that are kind of linear across. And that was sort of the back of the tailgate. That was the farmer that was farming the land said, well, why can't we do it like this? So clearly a huge discrepancy between what the government agency wanted to do and what the farmer that would be farming the land wanted to do. And it's important to mention that because, so this is what the final design ended up looking like. The infield buffers and the contour strips may create the least amount of harm or they might be you know the the best or whatever you want to say but if it's unfarmable it's it's never going to be implemented and it's you know to me i would rather get some some prairie out on the land and it's these designs have to be something that's going to work for all of the stakeholders involved you know particularly the the landowner and and if there's a, a tenant farmer involved the prairie strips and this is going maybe further into the weeds and we need to go but prairie strips are available through the US Department of Agriculture and there'll be a, a service center in your county all across the country, all in, in every state, there's gonna be a service center in the county. You could go there and you could ask for a CP43 or prairie strips. The prairie strips allow for or the, the CRP standard that it provides some cost share through the US Department of Agriculture allows for all or portions of the edge of the field to be buffered. And then those strips can be turned around on. And that's kind of a first time thing for a CRP program. So if you have end rows going up and down a hill, you could buffer that hill slope, hill slope and then turn around, um, you know, basically plant perpendicular into those, into the prairie. And then you're not gonna have end rows along the edge of the field where water is basically flowing freely down the middle of the rows. Uh, but that's just kind of a little bit of an example. There can be a lot of give and take and the end design is not always going to be either what my idea was or what the USDA idea was. Um, if you're looking for wildlife, um, I think that's, yeah. So um, prairie strips are flexible and whatever the goal of the farmer would be or the landowner would be, you can accommodate that to a large degree. And if they're designed um, interested in wildlife, whether that's game birds or um, you know, non-game wildlife, wider is always gonna be better. So the minimum width is 30 feet. I wouldn't go any narrower than 30 feet if you're gonna put some kind of habitat like this on your property, but wider is always gonna be better. You're gonna have better nest success, um, you know, better foraging for pollinators, things like that. And then connectivity, if you can get even better, you know, connect it to uh, a stream or a drainage ditch, connect it to uh, a stand of trees, your grove, connect it to something else that allows those wildlife to move safely around. That's going to be really critical. Oops. So this is kind of a drone footage of that, uh, the map that I just showed. Uh, here you've got you can kind of see these large blocks of habitat. And this one I'm really proud about. I, I talk about this just about every time I give a talk, but it's important to consider equipment with. So in the modern world that we live in, some of this equipment is just very, very large. And it can be challenging to sit in the cab and be a significant distance away, say from the end of your implement. And windows for harvesting and windows for planting can be somewhat short you know, in a year that's really wet. 
it's good to not take away any efficiency from that farm. And with this design, um, you can see the, the middle strip gets a little bit wider as we go south or towards the bottom of the screen. And what we did is create created two uniform farming lanes on either side of that. So you're not going back for any point rows um, you know, it would all just be even passes with the planter on either side. So again, you go through and you're not traveling through the same area, just doing a partial pass, if that makes sense. Um, seed mix design, I think getting a little bit short on time, but thinking about the diversity aspect on all this, you want to have a mix of grasses, forbs, legumes, just a, a mix of species. And that's going to be good for wildlife and good for diversity, but more than just diversity for diversity's sake, you're going to do a better job at controlling weeds. The more niches or the more different guilds of plants that you have that are occupying that ground space are going to do a better job at outcompeting um, some of the annual weeds that are just trying to grow as big as possible, put out as much seed as possible, uh, and, and moving through like that. Planting time, you can kind of plant prairie any time of the year. I, I wouldn't necessarily plant too late in the summer, you know, like getting towards August here in Iowa, I wouldn't plant because you're just not sure what that moisture availability is gonna be. And then I wouldn't plant onto any more than about three or four inches of snow, but you can really plant just, just about any time. Dormant season plantings, which would be kind of now, um, planting through the winter, you're going to have a higher amount of your flowers or forbs show up. And again, these are temperate wildflowers. Uh, they have mechanisms within the seed that once that plant blooms and creates seed, it's not going to just want it to fall off and start growing right away because those frosts are going to kill it. So it's like it needs to basically sit and say, well, I need about 60 to 90 days of cold, moist weather. And then when the soil gets to 50 degrees, I'm going to start cooking. So you will have more flowers if you seed in the fall. Um, you can have a little bit better stand of, uh, yeah, I guess that's, that's it. So I, I would, I'd recommend going in the fall. You could certainly do it any time of the year, but I've, I've seen plantings kind of be further along if they're planted in the fall. And then a more diverse seed mix will just re result in a more diverse stand, which makes sense, but if you, Put more seeds out there that are suited for your soil that are suited for your region you know trying to get seed within about 150 or 200 miles of where your farm is that stuff's going to be adapted to grow in your area um, establishment maintenance uh, this is actually out at my family's farm mowing some prairie strips that we have what you want to do is mow in that first year and the, again what i said before about the Annual species are, are just a totally different animal than what you get with this prairie. The annual species are gonna try to grow as big as possible to put out as much seed as possible. So then they, they can survive into future generations where the prairie is really gonna be growing down for the first couple of years. You know, working into that below ground bio, biomass, putting a lot of energy into those thick, deep roots that they have. So mowing basically levels the playing field and gives the species that are out there a chance to, get the sunlight they need, get the nutrients they need, things like that. Um, you can see here, yeah, it gives them just a competitive advantage. This is a wonderful picture out of the University of Northern Iowa's Tallgrass Prairie Center. On the left and right hand side of the ruler, you have the same species, it's gray-headed coneflower, retibita panata. But you can see in the no-mo scenario, which is the left side of the ruler, these seedlings, you're basically stranding them in just this dark forest where it's like they're, they're maybe going to live, but they might not persist in the future years. They're putting down less roots and they're just really struggling to get the nutrients they need. But so by mowing, you kind of give them a jump start in those first couple of years. Uh, prairie is not no maintenance, it's low maintenance. People pitch this as something that is, oh wow, like you can, you know, convert your lawn to this and then you don't have to do anything that's not accurate it's a low maintenance thing and invasive weeds especially perennial weeds you know i've been talking a lot about annual but perennial weeds like canada thistle need to be scouted and controlled during establishment because there's something that can create a wild problem um, you look at this picture here this is out of uh, purdue university in the midwest here this was a really, really neat experiment. And it's like, I've spent a lot of time 
doing ecological restoration, which is essentially chainsawing and um, going after weeds, man, you got to hand it to this Canada thistle. What an adversary. This thing is incredible. Um, so one 12 inch rhizome section, so like an underground root put into this chicken wire box and four months later, you've got a box that's just absolutely jam packed with rhizome. Um, this is something that if you see it, go after it. You know, here I've got just kind of a smattering of small thistles coming up. Um, boy, there's something that you, you need to take seriously kind of right away. And anybody that's dealing with a prairie, it's like, you're, you're probably gonna have Canada thistle. I don't care if you're in Oregon or if you're in Pennsylvania or where you are, it's like, this is just a, it's really gotten out there and it's a tough one to control. So eliminating or reducing the presence of this weed before planting your prairie is going to be the best. Um, tillage is about the only thing I would really stay away from ahead of time because again, you can imagine that root rhizome, if you run some piece of tillage equipment through the underground rhizome and tear that up, um, it's going to be like you've unleashed a terrible wizard spell and you've turned one plant into 50 plants because each section of rhizome, as long as it has a couple nodes on it, will absolutely flourish and grow into another plant. Um, so if you can just be aware of what's out there before you seed and get it under control, that's gonna be a very good option in terms of non-chemical control. Um, but if it's already out there and you're wondering what do we do after the seeding, so if you can mow it at bud stage or before, you, know, you don't wanna allow it to get any bigger than that. It'll help the prairie get a competitive advantage if you hand pull, if you've got a small area, you can hand pull the thistle at bud stage, taking the material and removing it from the property. You know, don't just kind of allow the, the pulled material. Don't, don't set it back there, put it in a bag or something, take it off site. If you can hand pull for two years and be as thorough as possible, it's pretty effective. That's not always going to be possible. Um, but again, if you have a big patch and you're doing non-chemical control, you know, somebody like Paul, that's an organic producer, if you can mow it, because anytime that plant is bigger than about six inches, it's just going to be pumping energy back into that rhizome. So you have to get after it right away and just prevent it from, at the very least, going to seed. And then it won't respond that well to competition from the prairie, but it's going to take some time and it's going to take scouting. So, you know, my, my boss, Matt Liebman, always used to say the, the best fertilizer is your shadow with something like the Canada thistle, just watch it, just scout it, just stay after it. And even if you're gonna do herbicide use or chemical control, it's definitely best when it's pair, paired with timing, timely mowing. If you can mow the areas that you have, you've got the dense problems, um, you know, and then come back and spray those rosettes when they're a little bit smaller, it'll be a lot better than just kind of um, spraying everywhere. Cause a lot of your prairie species are broad leaves and um, things like milestone, stinger, transline, like amino pyrolid, clopyrolid, things in the sunflower family and you know, a lot of the broadleaf prairie flowers are really not going to be happy um, having that stuff sprayed around them. And then long-term maintenance, just a couple more. Um, so prescribed fire, this area basically here in the Midwest from kind of Minneapolis down to Kansas City, the whole area would have burned. Um, this is burned regularly by the Native American peoples that lived here um, prior to settlement of the European folks. And these plants are adapted to it, um, you know, but the invasive weeds aren't. So prairie fire can be, it can be a little bit intimidating, but it can also be really fun. Um, we try to host field days. I think PFI probably does too, where we're trying to teach people how to, how to burn and how to burn safely. If it's not something that you know about, you know, find a neighbor that's doing it and watch them or offer to help um, or find someone that has experience. You know, there's likely a list of contractors that you can reach out to that would be available at that local USDA service center that could help with some of that stuff. So um, many conservation practices, including prairie strips, are available as part of the USP, USDA CRP program, just meaning that there's cost share available for doing conservation. We're talked, I talked a lot about prairie strips here, but a combination of practices, no-tills, cover crops, saturated buffers, bioreactors, waterways, a combination of practices on the same acres are always going to produce the best results. You know, you need um, 
the the more you know prairie strips it's not going to work on every single farm i think you can find opportunities to put perennials on on your land but it's always going to be something that you know don't rely on prairie strips alone um, or don't rely on just one practice whether it's cover crops or organic farming or whatever you're doing try to mesh those practices together it's going to be the healthiest for your land and it's going to be the healthiest for the water um, that's leaving your property uh, I threw a lot of stuff at you there in a short amount of time, but if you wander over to prairiestrips.org, all of the peer-reviewed scientific publications that the team has put out over the last 15 years are available there, and there's dozens of them. If you want to send an email to the Prairie Strips team, just prairiestrips at isstate.edu, and you can get at me directly or get at any other member of the team and ask, you know, pointed questions about any any of this stuff, you know, we'd be happy to talk to you. That's a big part of what our job is. And then if you're looking for any kind of social media stuff, we're on both Twitter and Instagram. And there you can find out about upcoming field days or just see some of the pretty pictures or see some of the, you know, uh, crazy field work and research that goes into putting together some of these numbers and things. So um, with that, I think Paul Muggy is going to talk about his specific experience with putting prairie ships on his property and Thanks for your attention, everybody. And I guess, uh, yeah, I'll say, Paul, you can take it away. I'm gonna stop sharing the screen. Okay, I guess I'll share mine. Okay, can you see my screen and hear me? Are we good? Yep, go ahead, Paul. Okay, um, thanks, Tim. That was great. I uh, probably should not have allowed you to talk first. You, um, I'm going to probably say a lot of things that you've already said. But again, thanks. That was great. Thanks to PFI and, and thanks especially to the Strips Project. I, I am Paul Muggy. I farm in far northwest Iowa. And uh, anybody can contact me any anytime they want. Um, I am an organic farmer. I've been farming since 76. I've been organic for about the last 20 years. And I have a, a range of, of strip establishment times. My first strip was established 20 years ago um, before this was on anybody's radar. The second, uh, about six years ago, and then the third more recently. And each of those strips have have goals and uh, associated with them specifically, but there are some, some general goals too. And one of the, the real benefits of these strips is that like Tim said, they're, they're almost as good as, as terraces for resource conservation, but there, there are so many other benefits to them. And, and some of them are, uh, and I'll accept that my screen won't, Uh -oh. Why won't my Can you use your arrow key, Paul, on your keyboard? Yeah, if you yeah, I did. You didn't. It maybe won't... click click back on the screen. Did you get clicked off the thing somehow? Maybe like just click somewhere. There. Yeah. Okay. Wow. Not sure what that was, but if I were putting strips in now, you know, these are some of the some of the benefits that I would look at. And Tim's already talked about some of these, just to get extra biodiversity out on the land, just not just corn and soybeans, but a lot of other plants like there used to be. Um, wildlife habitat, um, pollinator habitat, you know, bees and butterflies are, have kind of fallen on, on hard times and uh, the pollinators need some, need some habitat too. I also as an organic farmer, I need beneficial insects out there. I can't use insecticides or other pesticides. So I rely on, on mother nature and some of these free ecosystem services, but you, you have to provide them some habitat too. Uh, this is also true for seed predators. And, and I'll talk about those a little bit more later on. And, and just aesthetics, the, these things are just beautiful. And there's, there's something therapeutic about going out and walking in a prairie, even if it's a reconstructed prairie that isn't real prairie, it's it's still therapeutic. So my first strip um, established 20 years ago, uh, this is CRP uh, and 
this was a 15 year contract. So I've, it's been renewed once the practice was living snow fence. And just recently Prairie strips have its own practice for CRP, but that wasn't the case when I did this, the, my local NRCS guys had to kind of scratch around a little bit and figure out something that would work. But this strip is uh, right along two major highways. So they uh, think that it's gonna keep a lot of snow off of, off of the highway and it, and it does, I think. But one of the reasons that I did it was as a barrier to my neighbor's GMO pollen. I was just getting into organic farming. I was really worried about my neighbor to the South and uh, his pollen because there's zero tolerance for GMO in organic crops. So I planted some trees and shrubs in this strip. And in retrospect, that was a mistake because it means that I can't burn it. And um, also I'm not sure how effective it would be anyway. So I wish I, wish I wouldn't have done that, but this was, this was difficult to do because there were no seed mixes out there. You couldn't go out and buy anything and, and nobody really knew how to do this. Um, I get seed catalogs and there was 400 different different species of plants and you have to try and sort through that. I, I tried to get, get it so there was something flowering all the time to aid the pollinators. I also did not buy anything that had the word weed as, as part of its name, but everything had different uh, germination requirements, um, like Tim alluded to. So some things had to be in the freezer for, you know, 30 days or for 60 days, and the seeds were all different sizes. Some things are, are just like powder where you'd get a thimble full of seed to, to seed a couple of acres. So it was a real challenge and I spent a lot of time on it, but it's a lot easier now. And uh, just basically by pure dumb luck, it, it worked pretty well. Um, the picture on the left, you can see the highway there on the left side. So there's, there's a strip of crop, um, one planter width, 30 feet between the strip and the fence. Um, and NRCS folks talked me into that thinking that there would be a lot of snow that would accumulate there. And I, I might get really good yield off of those rows. And, and that's kind of worked. It, uh, it hasn't been a problem. And uh, the, I, it's 20 years old and I still have a, most of it, a pretty good mix of, of plants. I'm get, getting some brome encroachment and uh, some thistles. I'll talk about those a little bit later also. This is earlier in the spring. There's a, there's a lot of stuff out there and you can kind of see the, the trees. I tried to, since nobody really knew how to do it, I tried to just plant everything that was native to Iowa as far as trees and shrubs. So thinking that that would be about as good as I could do. Um, I got some help from Rob DeHaan at Dort College, knows a lot about prairie and he helped me as much as, as anyone and it has, has turned out all right. And again, that's that's CRP funding and I still get that. Uh, I know you can't see this. This is the seed mix that, that I used and the different columns here are when they flower and you know the, the germination requirements and how many seeds you wanna plant per acre. And so you can maybe get a, get a feel for, for the effort that that was in those early years. The, the more recent one, the one six years ago, that is CSP and this protects a field about 30 acres in size. And it's, it's a lot like what Tim talked about. There's one end of these strips that are on the contour ends in a, a grass headland. The other end is a grass waterway. The strips are on the contour and uh, I'm on a ridge plant system. So all of the, any water that runs off ends up in that grass waterway and runs off pretty, pretty clear. And, and I'm not, really hilly. I don't have highly erodible land. This is probably 5% slope, but the slopes were pretty long and I would get a lot of erosion along that waterway. And this pretty much eliminated that problem. 10% of the, of the field is in strips and it has been, been very effective. Um, that's another view of that with organic soybeans. 
this was uh, a practical farmers of Iowa I had a field day at, at my farm uh, several years ago. This is Lydia English talking here. And uh, this was one of the places that we stopped and looked. I'm, I'm not in that picture. I think I was headed for the tractor because we were about three fourths of a mile from getting out of that rain uh, and we made it. But these things are beautiful. Uh, one thing that I did with these strips and with the next one was I planted a beetle bank along the edge. The, the left side of this strip next to the beans, I made a little bit of a, of a berm, um, maybe six inches or so, and planted specific species there, um, bunch grasses that would be habitat for the seed predator insects. And they, they do quite a bit of this in Europe. And uh, while I'm here, you can see that the, the prairie plants really don't encroach upon the, the cropland at all. Um, that has not been an issue. And usually I have a, a deep ripper that uh, has just a shank every 30 inches. So I just make one pass along, along the side of that strip late in the fall. And I really don't have any of the prairie plants moving into the cropland at all. Um, seed predation. Turns out that if you leave that seed on the soil surface for long enough, something is going to eat it, but you need to provide habitat for those little creatures. Field crickets, carabid beetles, you know, when they're not active out in the field. And, and these beetle banks provide that. This is some work that Matt Liebman did um, a number of years ago. And in my system where the, like the soybeans are ridge planted, for example, those seeds are on the soil surface for about seven months out of the year. So between rodents and invertebrates, something like 70% of those weed seeds are eaten by something and, and birds probably get some more. So I need all the help I can get as far as weeds go. And uh, this is one of those free ecosystem services that I can take advantage of, but you have to leave the, the seeds on the surface and you have to provide a little bit of habitat for those creatures when they're not actively eating those weed seeds. This is the, the latest strip. This was established in 2018. And this was done with help from the Xerxes Society. And they uh, provided the seed for this. They were most interested in having a, a demonstration site for, for beetle banks. And uh, so this whole strip really is, is a beetle bank. And uh, it's also been quite effective. Uh, the Xerxes Society is uh, their main thing is protecting pollinators there and providing habitat. They're the largest invertebrate conservation society in the world. Uh, again, they provided the seed and, and some information on how to do this. The, and, it, and it's not just beneficial insects and pollinator insects that benefit, but insects in general are kind of falling on hard times. Um, some are doing just fine, but some are, are threatened and the world needs more insects. And I'm sure some of you are saying, yeah, it wouldn't bother me a bit if mosquitoes went extinct, but um, insects are the base of the food systems and they're helpful in, in cleaning up our waterways and improving soil health. And we need insects and, and we need habitat for them too. So how did I seed them? Uh, and Tim alluded to this too, to, to make it farmable, um, especially since I'm an organic farmer, I have to control weeds mechanically. And you know, if you're gonna cultivate, you just do not want stub rows. So I have uh, automatic GPS guidance. So I planted the, the whole field to corn. I did this with all of my strips, planted all to corn. And then when the corn is six inches tall, I went out there and, and tore out the, the 12 rows or the 30 foot where that strip was going to be. So I knew exactly where it should be so that I wouldn't have any stub rows. Uh, and this is really low tech. I just threw the seed out there with a little spinner seeder. I made several trips because I didn't want the, the various seed sizes to separate out 
in that cedar. Um, and then I, I guess I tine weeded it and dug the old Western land roller out of the grove. And uh, that's all it took. Um, this isn't really rocket science. That's what it looks like um, after it had been mowed. And you know, I'm sure that all the green things coming up are probably weeds. Um, that first year you have to mow it several times and the second year a couple times and maybe once even the third year, it's just going to look like all weeds um, the first year or two. But eventually the, you know, the prairie plants are gonna take over. And it looks like this now. And again, you get a lot of diversity on the landscape. Um, this isn't just for seed predators. This provides some, some resource conservation benefits here, here as well. Um, this, is, this plant is called Mexican hat. Um, the reason that I have a slide of it, not only is it beautiful, but it wasn't in the seed mix. And so it was, a contaminant, and I'm really glad I got it, but there are other contaminants too that like weed seeds that you have to be careful of. And I think it's important that you get local ecotype seed. If you have somebody that's that's close by that, that harvest prairie or, or raises prairie plants, that's gonna be your best bet. I've, I've heard horror stories of, of things like Palmer amaranth coming with a, a seed mix. I, I think they've gotten that problem corrected, but um, it's just something that you, you maybe need to watch out for. Economics, I, I really don't have much information. The, the first strip 20 years ago, that seed was, you know, um, borrow, buy, borrow, or steal kind of a thing. Some of it I got free and bought little pieces in other places. So. I don't really know what it what it costs, and it wouldn't really have much relevance to now anyway. I I really hit the home run on that one as far as the CRP payment. I when I when I re-upped, I hit it just exactly right, and I get about three hundred and eighty-seven dollars an acre for the CRP payment, whereas now they're only paying two hundred and forty dollars an acre. So again, I just lucked out on that one. The CSP strip, um, I did buy a seed mix there, cost me $900 an acre, but the seed was, that's a little more than it would ordinarily be because I bought some extra plants because of, of my uh, beetle bank. And I just seeded that by hand over the top. And, uh, and again, the, I did hire the County Conservation Board to seed that, um, and it was fairly inexpensive. Uh, the most recent one, again, that was uh, paid for, the seed was paid for by the Xerxes Society, and I maybe have $100 an acre in um, labor and, and variable costs in seeding that. Some of the challenges, Tim mentioned Canada thistle, and that's definitely a challenge. Um, the earliest, the 20 year old strip, I'm getting a handle on them there. I mowed them off for several years, mowed the patches right at bud stage. The, the bud stage is kind of the, the most vulnerable stage because that, that thistle has been putting a lot of its energy reserves into, into getting ready to produce seed. So it's, it's been kind of taking energy out of those root reserves and moving them into the plant. So if you can mow it off right at that time, um, they don't like that. Um, and that's a lot better than tillage in, in my experience. And I've kind of gotten them to the point now where I don't, I don't go out with a tractor, but I just go out with a weed eater when the thistles are budding and cut the tops off. And I'm, I'm winning, the, winning the war there, I think. It's, it's some work, like Tim said, you can't just forget about it. You have to manage it. But, but I, think I'm, I think I'm getting there. Uh, Mare's tail, people told me that would be an issue. There were some early on on the edges of it, but um, after being mowed a couple of times, they're just, they're gone. That wasn't an issue at all. Brome encroachment, especially, and, and like Tim said, you need that connectivity, 
but where the strip is connected to the grass headland on the one end and on the grass waterway on the other end where, where there's brome, that brome does encroach into the strip. And I'm not sure what to do about that. Um, I think it would probably help if I, if I burned at the right time, since the brome is more of a cool season grass and the prairie plants are more of a warm season grass. But uh, I don't know for sure. I'm, I'm still working on that one. I was a little worried um, that some of these plants might be alternate hosts for diseases or insects or habitat for pests. You know, I'm thinking that, okay, I've got habitat for all these beneficial insects, but am I also providing habitat for some pathogenic insects? And, and I don't know. Uh, I haven't experienced any issues. So um, uh, no news is good news, I guess. And these things really work well on an organic farm because I'm not spraying insecticides or herbicides out there. And, you know, these guys with their hundred and some foot booms, I'm not sure how you would keep spray away from those strips. Or if you're aerial spraying for spider mites or soybean aphids or something, that would be a real hindrance. So it, they work really good on, on organic farms. Okay, that's, um, that's all I have. Um, and I'm certainly willing to take questions. I'm sure Tim is too. Oh, I, I did forget though. I wanted to, to thank Tim um, about, oh, when he, after first, when he first started with the strips project, he presented at a field day down by hosting where they had a strip. And I was just intrigued by how beautiful that was and the, the diversity that there was there. And that's, that's what encouraged me to come home and, and plant my, my CSP strip. So thanks, Tim. Questions? I'll stop sharing here. Well, thank you both. And we've got lots of questions. Paul, I'm actually going to follow up on that last slide with a couple of questions. So one, um, earlier somebody did ask about herbicides. And so could, could maybe the both of you or whoever talk about how sensitive strips are to herbicides um, and how careful you have to be maybe or not? I'm sure Roundup would be an issue. Uh, obviously, I don't have any experience with herbicides. So maybe, maybe Tim, you have more than me. Yeah, that's a really good question. And it's one we encounter a lot. So we're certainly very aware of with the nature of the strips being the broadleaf species, if you're applying a broadleaf herbicide, you're going to have to be careful. What we've seen, um, you know, going back to the Neil Smith strips, the prevailing winds there in central Iowa in the summer were from the south, and that's typically when the herbicide applications were going to happen. You would see um, if there was drift into the strips, plants curling, cupping, turning brown, maybe not blooming, but again, you've got that deep root reserve they're most likely going to come back from the roots and not kill the plant. But that's a very different story than a direct application where, say, the boom goes over the, goes over the strip itself. I mean, Paul mentioning, yeah, 120 foot wide boom. Imagine that as in the operator or the farmer, you're sitting 60 feet away from the edge of where you're applying herbicide. Um, it can be difficult to be conscientious when the equipment is so big. So, there's a, there's a variety of different things, I guess, that you could do, but the, the biggest thing, you know, reading your label, reading and following the label instructions on the herbicide are going to be the best thing to do, you know, not applying when the wind is too high, not applying when it's too hot, not applying too early in the day, too late in the day, whatever it's going to be, following those rules is going to be good, and then just kind of keeping your boom as low as possible, um, you know, watching the wind speed, just, just things that you could do as kind of a conscientious operator in the first place. So the drift is not as much of a problem, but direct application, you've got a good chance that you're going to have to replant some, some strips. And I'm not a, an entomologist or a bee scientist, but there's some really exciting work looking at uh, things like neonicotinoid, which is the seed treatment that's commonly put on uh, conventional corn and soy. And looking at how those are kind of moving through the field and then into the soil and into the plants and all that. Um, so that's something I would say kind of stay tuned. We've got some papers that are headed towards publication now about a lot of those 
because a lot of these questions are very interested. We're interested in them too, but it takes multiple years to kind of get answers to this stuff. Um, kind of working on a modified bedtime over here, so bear with me. <laughs> You're fine. <laughs> I might well, make. A, and then, go ahead, Paul. I might make a comment on the neonicotinoid um, insecticides. Um, the problem with them is the the newer air planters that well will blow some of that seed treatment around and it's systemic. So it will land on the on plants and some of that is expressed um, quite a lot in the, in the seeds, in the pollen, in the nectar. Um, Iowa State had some, a couple of beehives on my farm looking for just that. And, and they found that toxin from the neonicotinoids in the in the nectar that the bees were bringing back to the hive so um it is an issue it's probably one of the things involved in the colony collapse disorder and and uh hopefully they're getting that finally figured out so paul i was really intrigued by your question about you know you're providing habitat for all these beneficial species what <laughs> other things might you be hosting tim do you have like is there any research on that to indicate like um what disadvantage you know like what are there any non-ideal uh <laughs> insects question. hanging out in there <laughs> yeah, that, yeah i know that there are a lot of beneficial insects that i do have in those strips and i'm not much of an entomologist so so i don't really know i i really haven't had any any insect issues there is a little bit of research that would say that having those pollinators available there in large numbers in a soybean field might actually give you a yield bump. Um, but that's pretty limited research at this point. But uh, Tim, you were going to comment. Yeah, uh, so the biggest thing that we've looked at is like the ground beetles, the native bees and the honeybees. So from an insect perspective, you know, there's more going on out there than what we realize. I'll just go back to the, the same kind of fu fundamental principle. If you're doing crop rotations, if you're doing organic farming, you're doing no-till, you know, you're doing all these things, you're going to be providing habitat for spiders, for beetles, for these things that are basically an army that's helping you out there. So I would say just the more of those kind of the the things that you can do that are more closely mimicking the natural world you're probably going to have more of a balance um, than you would be again with just the you know annual crop monoculture all that yep i think diversity is is good one thing that i have really seen is anthills there's some huge anthills out there have you seen that tim i mean like termite mounds yeah yeah so i've um I've, been fortunate enough to do a lot of prairie burns and like help with the Neil Smith crew and some other folks and it's really neat to burn an area and you realize very quickly that the ground even here in Iowa is not supposed to be flat right you know you'll see these like yeah gigantic ant mounds it'll be um yeah I mean they can be two feet tall just huge huge so yeah I've I've noticed that too I don't know I think it's fascinating I don't know anything about it but it's neat yeah I should mention too that I have started burning strips that, you know, the first one I can't because of the trees, but I, I have started burning the other ones and, and you're not supposed to burn all of them the same year. You have to allow some that are unburned this year for some of the wildlife for birds to go to. And, and one of the things I was worried about early on was the width of those strips that it would become an, an ecological trap that um, it looks like a really good place for, for mommy bird to build a nest and lay her eggs, but, but it would be really easy for a, a skunk or a fox or something to come along and, and clean out every nest that's in that strip. So um, I was worried about that. I'm not sure what the answer is for sure. My strips are 30 feet wide. Uh, and, and like Tim said, wider is probably better. Um, that's something, yeah, Paul, I want to jump in because, so we've got a lot of people that are working at Iowa State and the, the work that some of these grad students do, you know, waking up at the crack of dawn to go out and look for birds nests and, and things in these strips, it's, 
um, it's not something I'd necessarily want to do, but it's really laudable and it, it's, it's hard work. And one of the cool things that they found um, related to the ecological trap, because that's something that we get a lot um, and, and certainly understanding where that's coming from by taking, you know, a small amount of diverse high quality habitat and then plunking that into, you know, basically the middle of a row crop field. Yeah, it seems like it could be a dangerous thing. But e ecological trap uh, is, is a little more of a complicated deal um, than it seems like. And basically think of it this way. If the prairie strips, so how to spot an ecological trap would be compare the prairie strips and what the nest success is there. Is that lower than surrounding vegetation? And that would be, say, the ditch, you know, or something like that. And what they found is just specifically with ground or with grassland birds, the nest density and the nest success rate happens to be higher in the prairie strip than it is, say, in, in a ditch or in a waterway. So it's not, it's not fantastic habitat, but it's just about kind of finding an opportunity to give these species something else, just something that's maybe a little bit better where you have that diversity of vegetation where that skunk or whatever, the raccoon, the coyote is gonna have to work a little bit harder, you know, than, than just working through and finding it. So at least in terms of the birds, we haven't found it to be an ecological trap. And I would say that that holds true to a lot of the other species that are out there. Great. about um earlier there was two different questions around grazing are there grazing opportunities for strips potentially Ooh, uh i i guess it late in the fall maybe after the crops were off but like for mine that are crp and csp i'm would not be allowed to graze those unless it was an emergency grazing situation that was allowed. You know, if you did it during the year, you'd have to fence them, which would almost be prohibitive. And it, and it might be, well, I'm not sure if it would be damaging to the, to the vegetation or not. Uh, you know, the prairie had buffaloes that were good for the prairie. So I don't know. That's another one that we get a lot. Um, so yeah, you got to stay in compliance with whatever the regulations would be if you are enrolled in some kind of program. And like Paul said, unless there's an emergency drought declaration or something along those lines, probably not going to happen. Um, several of the, the farms that we have strips on, they'll do exactly what you said, Paul, where they'll graze after the crop is out and they prefer the strips to lay in because you have all that biomass, you know, it's just a little bit warmer. So I'd imagine, you know, help them keep weight on a little bit better, all that. Um, in terms of the summer, if you were going to put, say you had fence, say you had the perfect situation going there, uh, it would be uh, like a more of a flash grazing thing where you put them on and pull them off. Because say you've got a really, like those pictures that you showed in your strip pole, that's beautiful. But if you put them out in the wrong week in the summer and you get rain, what was a nice prairie could suddenly turn into a wet hole and you've got mud and then you've got Canada thistle. So it would have to be a management thing. And there are other people on the team that are more well-versed in the prairie than I am. And I know the grasses can be good, but some species, like I was on a different call today where we got on the subject of horses and horses would be not quite enough uh, nutrient content basically in the, in the prairie. But in the summer with these warm season grasses, say you've got a pasture of cool season that's kind of in a slump at that point, well, maybe then, you know, with the prairie, you've got all these warm season grasses, you've got a ton of biomass, you could maybe supplement, um, you know, put them out on that and give a little extra hay or something like that, some extra feed. So it's, it's possible and certainly like uh, keep us posted if, if anybody's interested in that kind of research or anybody already knows about that. Somebody asked about, can income producing trees be planted on the strips? Paul, earlier you mentioned that your first strip that you did, you had some like woody shrubs and maybe even some trees in it um i guess can the two of you talk about trees and woody species in prairie strips and like what that means for the for the prairie strip yeah the first the first strip i had was like 60 feet wide and there is a row of of trees and a, a row of shrubs and there's probably half a dozen different types of shrubs Again, I was looking for things that were native. So I have oaks um, mostly for trees. 
Um, shrubs were, were all native, except I have some lilacs just because I like lilacs. Um, but again, it means that you can't burn. Um, and I did accidentally light this one on fire with my uh, flame cultivator. Uh, so now I have, when I flame cultivate, you know, I, and, I, and I flamed right next to grass waterways and never had a problem, but I bail those. And that, that strip has a whole lot of fuel just sitting there. And even turning the row off next to that, I still lit it on fire. And, you know, I had a, a dirt shovel and a fire extinguisher and yeah, you don't have a chance. <laughs> you have to call the volunteer fire department. Uh, and that's embarrassing. You know, like I'm the idiot that lit that on fire. But now I, I put a tank on my tractor and a pump so I can kind of be my own fire department. Um, and for burning them too, you know, I can soak down the ends so I know it's not going to get into the into the waterway or something. So and you have to pick your day, you know. Yeah, I, I would just add to that. Um, it, it would depend if if you're just going to do it yourself um, and you want you don't want to enroll in any program. Absolutely, you know, you, trees or shrubs, you know, just exactly like um, I guess what what Paul was doing back in the day. I guess that was a CRP program, but um, you could you could certainly do that. And shrubs and things are going to add structure. They're going to add wintertime cover. You know, there's going to be some value there for wildlife. It would just kind of depend if you want to enroll in a program, what you're thinking of. And if you're going to do it in like a row crop setting here in Iowa, we're talking about, you know, certainly you would want to stay far enough away from that crop edge so you're not, you know, grabbing equipment as it's going by. Um, so there, there'd be some things to think about there, but uh, certainly, you know, there's a lot of people that ask that question. And, and again, another area of active research, and it'd be something to think about that you could absolutely do if you wanted to. And I do have a lot of a lot of birds that nest in those trees and shrubs that I have out there. Um, they're used a lot for bird habitat. And then, could you could somebody comment on the cost of seed per acre to establish prairie strips? Again, I think one of you covered this, but generally, how much it costs to establish? I didn't cover it very well. Tim, probably you know a lot more than I do currently. Yeah, so um, prairie is is kind of an unregulated market, so it, it can fluctuate with demand. Um, if you want to order seed, um, you know, ordering it, say, in January for a spring project is the sooner you can get it ordered, the better, because as, you know, a supplier is only going to have a certain amount of seed, and then once that supply goes down, price is going to go up, just kind of simple economics like that. Um, you could probably get away with even today planting prairie for 200 bucks an acre, maybe 300 bucks an acre. We did some, um, my family's farm last January and we planted, a it was like a 65 species mix. It ended up, it was like $500 an acre. So there's kind of no upper limit to what you could spend. You know, you could get over a hundred species. You could spend a thousand dollars an acre. Um, if you're just looking for, you know, more diversity or if you want local ecotype, stuff like that. But again, there's a lot of flexibility there. And, and even for 100 or 200 bucks, um, you can get away with, with doing a seeding. Um, I, I would say uh, there was just a question about where to find seed. So again, if you can find like something that's within 200 miles or even better, 150 miles of your place, like say 200 miles east and west or 100 miles north and south, that would be kind of the ideal. Because within these species, there's going to be subspecies and kind of things that are just like locally adapted to that area. And it keeps the genetic population stronger for the remnant stuff that's still there if you can, if you can kind of find that. Um, as a state of Iowa employee, I, I don't have any opinion about where you get your seed, nor can I have any, any opinion about what companies are good for seed. But just Google it. Just look for prairie seed. There's, you know, here, if, you, if you're in the Midwest, Galen, there's a lot of suppliers and we're really lucky that way. Um, that there are a lot of people that are kind of stepping into that market and there's a lot of good seed available. And then I guess just while we're talking about cost, I, I think I saw during the thing, people were asking about, you know, the um, kind of profitability of these things. And certainly the biggest cost of the strip is going to be that opportunity cost that's lost by converting the row crop land into something like prairie that's not making as much money. 
but we're at such an interesting time right now where there's so much technology in terms of precision agriculture that's out there that you can really identify. Um, you know, I, I heard an interesting thing that it's like, what, 40% of the field is making money, 20% of the field's not making money, and 20% of the field's breaking even, something like that's 80%. I don't know, it's getting late. Anyway, um, the parts of the field that make money kind of subsidize the rest of the field, right? And we kind of gloss over, it's like, oh yeah, like this field, I made this much money per acre. But within that, that subfield zone, there are acres that are, you know, anywhere from, yeah, say 3%, 5%, 20%, whatever it is that you're not making back the diesel fuel, the spray, the time, all of that. So if you can target those areas and begin to, you know, think about you're not max, a farmer's goal is to not maximize yield, it's to maximize profit, right? It doesn't matter to anybody how much corn, I mean, that's, you go to a farm show and what was, what was, what did that yield, whatever, everybody wants to know that, but really it's like, the profitability should be the goal. And we have so much technology now that you can really pinpoint those areas of the field that are maybe not making as much money. Um, so that'd be something to think about too when you're laying these things out. You both talked about Canada thistle and how much of a problem it is. It's an invasive species. Are there any other like problematic species or invasive species that can creep into prairie strips or you have to watch out for? Just thistles Freeze. and, yeah. and brome, um, you know, and even in the native prairies in, in the area, they have brome encroaching on them. Uh, it's just an exotic species and has has an advantage, but uh, I really haven't had problems with anything other than than thistles at this point. Yeah, just the woody species. Um, you know, the succession forces are so strong, and with prairie, it's like you know we're really trying to keep that in a stasis point. You know, we're not because here we get enough moisture in the Midwest that if left kind of to its own devices a prairie is going to turn into a woodland over time it's just it's yeah. we have enough moisture we have enough tree seeds that are floating around so those things can become a problem and that's where just periodic um just scouting to make sure you don't have a problem and then uh you know burning at the right time is really going to do a good job of just eliminating those seedlings so that's something to think about and then a uh like Paul said with the brome, you're kind of asking Paul what, what you could potentially do about that. And that would be uh, appropriately timed burns, but like multiple years of appropriate, appropriately timed burns, like kind of as, as late into the spring as you can. With the brome, if you can kind of let it flush and turn green, um, I think it's like the once it has like two or three leaves, something like that, go in, rip a burn. You're not going to kill it, but you're going to set it back. And if you just kind of make that your new hobby for a few years, you can weaken it. Um, but it's again, it's it kind of be a new hobby for you. It'll take a few years. Okay. Somebody asked about mowing earlier and you've talked about it, both of you at multiple points and kind of the, the message I'm hearing is that there's somewhat of a standard expectation of how much you wanna mow when you're first establishing the prairie strip, but then maybe it come like after establishment, it's more of the scouting and kind of deciding depending on your problem when you're gonna mow it or burn it. Is that accurate? Yeah, there's there is kind of a rule of thumb. I don't know it exactly, but like if it gets to um, a foot and a half tall, you mow it down to a half a foot tall or something like that. Um, and it, that second and third year, it, it really hurts to mow because you have some prairie plants that are going to seed and you think, oh, I really would like them to go to seed and you hate to mow them off. But I think it's important that you do that. I mean, those prairie plants will come back and seed next year. So you have to keep the weeds down. Yeah, just a simple rule of thumb that we tell farmers is when that material, so just the basically everything that's out there gets to be about knee height, mow it down to about four to six inches in that first year. And so it's not, it's not one time, it's not two times, it's just dependent on moisture. You know, sometimes that might be two times in the first year, other years you might have to mow it five or six times. You can't mow it too much, um, but in that first year, that mowing is, is really going to help um, just give you you're going to get your money's worth out of the seed that you put down a lot more so than if you just throw the seed out there and you say, we did it. 
Great. We have a question. So a topsoil depleted hilltop might be more profitable to put to prairie with fruit or nut trees possibly. 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 Yeah, I mean any any of that value added stuff is always going to be good if you have the um, if you have the capability to to do it and then to, you know, do the work to, you know, harvest and all, and all that stuff. Um, and you know like Paul said, when he enrolled in the first CRP program, I mean, getting almost $400 an acre for Plant and Prairie, I mean, that's pretty legendary. And you never know, um, those winds are always changing and prices are swinging back and forth. So um, having conversations with that, again, the, your local USDA service center, they're going to be able to talk to you about options and it's going to be a real, real no pressure kind of situation. You can talk to them about options and they'd be a great resource or you know, like your local, whatever your local university extension service, they'd be able to help with a lot of that stuff too. Yeah, I'm not sure that you'd be able to, if you were harvesting fruits or nuts, that you would be able to qualify for some of the government programs. But yeah, like Tim said, that's something you need to check out before you do it. All right, last question. What is your favorite prairie species? I like that Mexican hat that I found. That thing is, that was beautiful. But I only found one of them. <laughs> Boy, I, that's that's really tough. That's a that's a great question. And uh, it would kind of probably depend um, from from time to time. It, it'd be hard to argue there's, it's kind of more uh, more of a rocky, drier prairie species, but it's called pasque flower. Uh, it's kind of Easter flower. It comes up around Easter time, and it's it uh, it's one of the first things that blooms. And for me, as someone that like I'm not really a winter guy, I really like it uh, seeing those blooms coming out of the ground around Easter time. So that uh, I really really like. But just a, uh, the aesthetics of it, man, to have something just kind of blooming um, from April all the way almost into October, it's it's great. And it's beyond just the soil capturing ability or, or any of that, like Paul mentioned, the aesthetics. It's it's really here in the Midwest. It's our natural heritage. And it's something that we should be really proud about because it's really, really neat. I mean, it's kind of like a, it's equivalent of a rainforest. You know, it doesn't get the same um, maybe accolades as that, but it's really a, a lot of the same mechanisms are going on. And it's it's just, it's a wonderful thing. And I think once you get the prairie bug, it kind of, um, it'll really grab you. Yep. I have actually had high school kids that wanted to take senior pictures in my prairie strips because they, they really are pretty. And it is therapeutic to walk there. Well, thank you both so much for joining us for the farm webinar tonight, sharing your experience and expertise, answering questions, and thank you everybody in the audience for attending tonight. I will send out a thank you email in the morning and I'll include that contact information that Tim and Paul both shared at the beginning of the presentation so that it's handy and available for anybody that has any follow up questions. And then this is recorded if you want to go back and review anything or share it. Um, I encourage everybody to tune in next week for our farm webinar and have a good night. Thank you again, Tim and Paul. Thank you, everyone. Thank you.